afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Sheringan workshop part two. Um, we are very glad to see that uh, our familiar faces from previous workshop. Um, as last time, we have Sylvia with us, uh, and we have Lori as well. Um, just a quick reminder: please keep your microphone microphone muted. But in the meantime, if you want to have your cameras on, you're very welcome to. Uh, we just shared um, Sylvia and. Peter and uh, me just shared some links in the chat box. You can access our studio cloud. You can also access slides and you can access recordings from last um, workshop, which was on Tuesday. Um, and uh, yeah, now uh, over to you, Sylvia. Great, thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful to be back here. Um, thanks for joining me today. Let me go ahead and get started sharing my screen and I'll need host privileges for that. Should be okay now, hopefully. Okay, yeah, I think I'll be good now. Let's see. Okay, let's look at our slides. Yeah, see my browser seems to still be working. So let's see if we can move through or if it's gonna get a little bit stuck. We might just move a little bit slower than I would like. Um, okay, so welcome back for those of you that were here for part one. And then for those of you that are new, welcome. This is the second part to a two-part introduction to Sharingan, so package to develop presentations using R. And um, the second part will go through an extension package called Sharingan Extra, and then we'll go through CSS styling as well. Let's do this. There we go. Okay, so a little bit about me for those of you who weren't here on Tuesday. My name is Sylvia Canelon. I'm a postdoctoral research scientist at the University of Pennsylvania in the States. And you can find my um, contact info there at the bottom. And then I'd like to start off by um, going through some acknowledgments. So first off, I'd like to acknowledge Lori Baker, who's my co-pilot for this workshop today. And I'll let her introduce herself. Go ahead, Lori. Oh, I'm wondering if Lori maybe is having a hard time with the mic. Okay, well, while that gets sorted, and Lori, feel free to jump, jump in whenever you like. Um, I'll also thank the NHSR community for the opportunity to provide this workshop. And then also two themes that were used for this workshop or two packages, excuse me. One of them is the NHSR theme um, inside which the NHSR um, sharing and template is bundled and then the NHSR data sets package as well. And then of course, the Sharingan package and the Sharingan Extra package that I mentioned, as well as materials developed by Allison Hill, who's a, a data scientist and professional educator at our studio that have inspired and informed this workshop. So about you, um, you know Sharingan because you attended uh, part one of this workshop or because you've already been using it. Um, okay, you've seen pretty slides in the wild and you wanna make your own pretty slides about future you after this workshop. You can make your slides extra special with a sharing an extra package and you can customize your slides using CSS. Okay, so what's the extra? We're gonna go through three main extensions that I use all the time. We're gonna go over um, slide overview. Let's click through. Oh, my browser is being really laggy. Oh boy. Ah, let's try this again. Okay, and then the other two that we'll go through are setting and slide panels as well. Okay, bear with me. Now I'm seeing the spinning wheel on my computer. Okay. So these extra features are made possible by sharing an extra package, which is a playground of enhancements and extensions for shared in slides. And I've linked in here um, the page, the documentation page for sharing an extra. And you can see that there's a lot of 
different extensions, and then we'll be going through three of them today. And then the link to that site is there at the bottom. And you should be able to scroll within your slide deck in here as well. I'm just not able to show you because my browser is being um, a little funky. So let's take it slow so that things don't get too stuck. I'm a little bit nervous that my computer is going to crash, so we'll see what happens. I've got another computer on standby. Are other people able to um, get through the slides okay? Or am I the only one that's having issues with the bloating? All right, so slide overview with tile view. That's the first extension we're gonna talk about. The example presented here is what it looks like when you use this feature, which is just a zoomed out version of all your slides. It makes it really nice to navigate uh, to different parts of your slide deck. Oh, I won't let me go to the next pane. Huh, okay, so sorry folks, bear with me. I'm gonna try maybe logging in on another computer. Okay, let's see, it's trying to let me. So sorry, folks. All right, let's try to pick up where we left off. So uh, this is what a slide overview would look like. In terms of how to, the first thing you need to do would be to install sharing an extra from GitHub because it's not on CRAN, it's a very experimental package, which means there's a lot of cool features and a lot of cool extensions um, that are sort of being developed um, you know, relatively quickly, I should say. Um, and then step two would be to load the library and add the use tile view function to your setup chunk at the very top. And step three would be to save and render your slides. And then the last step would be to press the letter O for overview on your keyboard to see a slide overview. And you can also try pressing O at any point during the presentation if you're following along with the slides um, to see this in action. And then I've got, I've just linked here the reference document for, uh, for that particular feature that you can browse on your own later on. Okay, so the next thing we'll talk about is slide embedding with share again. And um, the, there's an example here, which is just the core site that we use for this workshop. And so you can't see it in here right now, but there's, uh, there's an embedded slide deck that you can see there. And then I embedded um, the slide deck for today on that court site as well. And so that's what it allows you to do. And the way you would do this would be to add the use share again function to your setup chunk. So earlier we'd add use tile view. Now we would add use share again. And then you would style the share bar by choosing social media sites in the setup chunk um, as well. And then you would embed your slides in uh, somewhere. So you could embed them in block down or other R markdown HTML documents, which is really, really nice. And then I've also linked the reference there for the documentation if you want to browse it on your own. Okay, so the first your turn will be to make your slides a little extra. And so I'll give you those two options that I just went over to um, either, either add slide overview or slide embedding. And then I've linked to, I think, the correct slides in there. So I'm going to go ahead and navigate to the RStudio Cloud project. Let me get back to the, uh, where's my menu? I wanna get back to the chat box and get that link. So RStudio Cloud, okay. There are a few housekeeping things that I wanted to do real quick in the cloud project, especially for those of you that are joining today that maybe weren't here um, on Tuesday. The main part being that there's a folder 
in the Studio Cloud project that's called, um, I think, Sample Slides, something like that. And it has a slide deck that's already um, sort of put together and built. There's a an about me slide, I think, near the beginning, and then there's a goodbye slide at the end that uses the NHSR community um, image as an example that you could replace with your own your own uh, photo if you like. But I just wanted to point that out if people want to use that today and just tweak it, they're more than welcome to do that. Or you can just continue adding to um, your slide deck from Tuesday. Let me just show you where that is real quick and then I'll and then I'll start the timer. So we're not we're not quite to the year turn yet. Let's see. Okay, so here we see the slide deck that I was referring to, the NHSR example slides. And so you'll see if you scroll down, if you open that up, and that's just located within, so this is our main spot. This is where the project sort of originates. That's where the project file is. Here under NHSR example slides is where you would find um, the, the deck that I'm referring to. And so if you open that up, this is what it looks like on the left. And so you have here a hello slide and some more links. And then let me just show you real quick what that looks like. And then as a refresher on Tuesday, we talked about rendering your slides in the preview window and you can use a sharing an infinite moon reader function to do that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and run that and then they should populate on the right hand side, which they did. And so we'll just go through real quick. So this is just a basic example of an about me and then like an outline kind of a slide. Some people like making table of contents like slides um, in their decks. And then there's, you know, the bullet points and stuff that we talked about last time. And then just some other examples. So you're welcome to tweak this one if you like today. Um, okay, that being said, let's go ahead and start the your turn. And I will set a timer using a new tool that I haven't used before, but that looks really handy. Okay, let's update every maybe 10 seconds. And the timer starts, did it already start counting down? No. Okay. Five minutes on the clock. And feel free to drop any questions in the chat box and Lori and I will look at them. online timer just gave out, so I'm just going to set my own. Give you another four minutes. And then if when you're finished with the your turn, if you want to just give me a heads up in the chat box, that would be great. Just a smiley face like Tuesday would be perfect. So Zoe's question, do you have to use hello or goodbye on the slides or is that just like a name tag? It's like a name tag. Um, you can read more about how to use them. I can share more links about, about that in particular, but it's nice if you wanna to refer to a slide and link to it. You don't have to use um, 
say like hashtag one or hashtag two at the end of the URL and said you could just use the name. And, um, and then you can also use some functions in sharing again where you can create a template and you would use name and then for example, hello, and then you'd kind of style it the way that you want. And then later on in your deck, if you want to use that same style, then you would just refer to that name and you would say instead um, template and then use the name that you've given that before. So that's kind of how that works. We've got about two minutes left. Oh, and then is this Peter? You said Tileview is working, so you were able to put it in your setup chunk and get it to work. That's awesome. Okay, you got one minute left for the your turn, and then we'll move on. Okay, so moving on, hopefully people were able to get those features, uh, at least one of them incorporated into the slide deck today. Let's see if we can move forward. Browser's being a little bit slow. through the panel sets. Okay, so let me just find my place again. Okay, here we go. So the next feature that we're gonna talk about from sharing an extra is panel set. Um, and this is another example of Oh, this is just an example of what panel set looks like, which you've, we've all seen many examples of throughout this deck and then also the deck on Tuesday. And so this just shows, um, this just has embedded the slide that we were looking at earlier when we were talking about tile view, but it has these different almost like file tabs on the, along the top, which lets you show different things. And just move forward. All right, 
I'm still waiting. Oops. Okay, so here's the how-to for panel set. So similar to the ones that we already use today, you would add another function to your setup chunk. In this case, it's the use panel set function. And then the next step would be to create a panel set that contains a panel, which is kind of like the tab. And you give that panel or that tab a name using the panel name class. And so there's a little example there under step two that would show you exactly what you would, um, the format that you would use. And I put a little tip here, which is that, you know, when you start working with panel set, because there's so many different um, classes with brackets, you know, that indicate that it's a class and you start nesting them, it can get a little bit, um, it can get a little bit hard to keep track of what's what. Um, so I like to add comments at the end of the panel. And then I'd like, I also like to add one at the end of panel set so that I can keep track of where I am in my, in my sequence. And then I have the reference in that last tab that it skipped over. Okay, and then this is an example of that same chunk that I showed earlier with the panel set. And so I just have one tab or one panel and I called it name. And then I just have my content that's um, inside of that. Okay, so let's try it live together. It's, I think it's helpful to see it, see it live. Okay, so I'm just gonna come back to my cloud project and I'm opening up, or I have opened up still the, the example slides that I was showing you earlier. And so I'm just gonna add a slide at the end. Here, I'm gonna add my three lines and I'm gonna just say, you know, heading of this slide has panels. And here, let me minimize this a little bit. So if I wanted to insert panel set or panels in this slide, then I would um, use the panel set class and that's at the, on the very, very outside. And, and then inside is where I would indicate the panel or the tab. And then I would also give it a name and I'm just call this tab one. And then I'm gonna make uh, actually, what I usually do is I go ahead and insert that comment right away. And the way that you do that in HTML is with um, a less than sign, an exclamation point, four dashes, and then another, and then a greater than sign. And so you could just write in the in the middle of that. And so I usually say end of panel. And then depending on how many tabs I'd like in that slide, then I would just copy and paste those chunks. And so, and then I'll just change the name. So I'm gonna give this the name tab one, or excuse me, tab two, tab three and tab four. And then right after that, that name is where you would include your content. And so I'm just making some room there for that. Make some room for that there. Making some room for tab three content and then for tab four. So you can see how already it's kind of split up into different tabs and it is kind of nice to see where the end of one panel is and then where the next one begins. So I'll just write here content for tab one. And then as I'm sure you've seen me do multiple times already, you can use other classes inside panel set and so if I wanted to use the pull left class that we talked about on Tuesday, for example, I could do this. Um, and I'm just going to write some content here. And then I also want to maybe put something on the right hand side. So I'll use pull right. And I'll just write pulling content to the right. And let me save. 
and then it'll get updated. And because we're using the sharing an infinite moon reader function, this should uh, update, but it hasn't. So let's see. Oh, you know what? I forgot to install packages. So let me go ahead and do that. I'm gonna use the function for installing from GitHub. And then I'm trying to remember the, I think it might be. install. So I wonder if maybe I didn't load it if it was already installed. Okay, so let's go ahead and load up an extra. And see if that takes care of it. Hmm. Oh, and then I forgot the function. Okay, so that's the other piece. Let me go back to my slides so I can remember what that is. Oops. This. Okay, so something I'll go ahead and highlight now is um, if you're following along with the slides, you should, I guess in theory, be able to copy, there we go, copy what's in the code chunks by just hovering to the top right, which is what I've just done. So let me come back here and I'm just pasting it. And let me save this again. Let's take another look. Okay, now we've got it working. So we can see the four different tabs that I made. There's tab two, tab three, and tab four with the pull left and pull right classes used in there. Okay, so let's go back to our slides. Let's give it a little bit of time. Wow, so many technical issues today. Yeah, and I see there's another one in the chat box. For a while, for a found for embedded use code. Oh, that's really helpful, thank you. I'll make sure to fix that. I mean, I guess while we're waiting for these slides, um, I think the ne next part is, next part might be a, might be a your turn, I don't remember. Let me get my slides opened on my other computer. Maybe we can just talk through some of this. Okay, we did panel set. Okay, so the your turn that's supposed to come next is five minutes to add another panel to the slide template that's provided in the slide. And, um, and so there's a little code chunk that you'd be able to copy and then modify. Let's see what questions pop up here though. I've got the panel view 
working, but not the tile view for some reason. Okay. And then when I tried to run the sample slides, I got an error of no package called icon. Okay. That's because I used the icon package to make the little like Twitter icon and thing. So um, you would need to install that package as well. And I don't know, Lori, if you're if you're online, but if you wouldn't mind helping connect people with that install link for the icon package, that'd be really helpful. Um, yeah, can, can do, Sylvia. Thank you. Okay, but then back to panel views working, but not tile view. So I wonder, Jonathan, if you have, um, if you were able to type the function in correctly in the setup chunk for the use tile view, I think there's, I think there's a little underscore in there. So it might be worth checking the syntax. Someone else says I have unresponsive pages. There's some problems with GitHub. Yeah. Yeah, that's too bad. Um, having trouble for sure. And then what else do we have here? Okay, panel set working fine, but I put a ggplot in tab three that was too big for a slide. Great, that's a really great tip. Yep, so that's perfect. Using big height and the chunk options um, can help adjust because panels do take up a little bit of room. And so sometimes if you have a plot that you're used to putting on one side, um, you'll of course have to adjust it when you, if you put it inside a panel because there's just not as much real estate. Okay, let's see. Now this is also unresponsive, which is a little frustrating. Um, let me think. Thanks, Lori. Okay, let me think through how I want to do this. I mean, I guess maybe I'll just present from my my R Studio IDE, and it just won't it just won't be full size because I think we're just having a lot of issues with that. Um, Telview now working, great, that's awesome. Okay, so let me come over to my IDE and maybe just render these slides. opening up my file. This is a sneak peek at the, the GitHub repo. If you want to go repo diving later for code, um, this is what you're going to see. So I'm just opening up my day two our markdown file and it's quite long because um, there's a lot of pieces to it. Longer than the example deck in the cloud project, for example. Okay, so now that I've got that open, I'm just gonna use my sharing in infinite moon reader function here as well to render my slides in my IDE. And I guess while we're waiting for that, I'm just gonna move this over to where my other stuff is, okay. Okay, so I've got my preview window going. Let me just make it a little bit bigger. Oh, actually, that's pretty nice. Okay, that's pretty good. I'm pretty happy with this. Okay, now because I've been jumping around all over the place, instead of having to click through all the slides, I'm gonna use tile overview to find my spot once again. Okay, so here's the your turn and the your turns are the red slides. So they're a little easier to find. This is a your turn that I was talking about. And so what I would um, like you to do next for the next five minutes is to, if you haven't already tried um, inserting a panel set, I know some of you have, but if you, if you haven't yet, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do this now. And I'm just gonna give you a couple minutes instead of the full five. Um, but go ahead and hover to the top right of that code chunk, copy the code, and then just make a, a brand new slide in your cloud project and put that in there. 
And, um, and so the direction is to add another panel to this slide template. So right now it's just got the one and it's called panel one. And so I have a little hint here at the bottom of the chunk um, to asking or offering for you to try adding um, panel two right underneath of where it says end of panel right here to insert a new one. So I'm gonna put two minutes on the clock just cause we have a lot of content that I would love to share with you. Uh, okay, two minutes starts now. And then feel free to continue putting questions in the chat box. And thank you so much for your patience. At about a minute left. Are the styles in a palinol inherited from the main slide tiles? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there, there are ways to tweak that. And I think we might have a better sense after we go through the CSS portion of the workshop. But yeah, short answer is yes, they're inherited from the main slides. Uh, let's see here. Slide question. I can insert pictures that show up in our markdown. Mm -hmm. Huh. I don't know why it wouldn't show up in sharing gun slides either. So the question was, you can use knitter include graphics to add pictures. And it'll display in the R markdown, but it does not knit into sharing gun slides. Let's see, and you've got Echo Falls out with 30%. Try and in include graphics. I wonder if you can take out cloud and project because I think it's relative to wherever the project file is stored. So I wonder if it might have a better, I just wonder if that might be part of it. I know you said that it was showing up in the R markdown, but maybe, um, maybe that's part of it. Okay, so let's uh, move on to the next super fun part, which is called, um, well, it actually doesn't have a name. I put a slide here with a really pretty picture that says explore because oftentimes when I'm trying to modify the CSS of, um, of anything that I'm trying to look at, it feels like I'm digging around and doing some investigative work. And so I like this little magnifying glass. Um, so this is just a transition into the CSS portion of the workshop today. And um, we actually have been on the call for about 50 minutes. And so it would be time for a break anyway. I'm gonna go ahead and set a timer for five minutes. I know last time we did a 10 minute break, we're a little bit short on time today. So I'm gonna give you five minutes to take a break, um, stretch out, do whatever you like, and then we'll see you soon. And the five minutes start now had asked earlier about whether or not the styling of the tabs is inherited from the main document. If you wanted to change those, um, then this is where I would start, would be with the panel set.css um, file. Although I'm not, I haven't done this myself, so I'm not entirely clear on where, where you might need to save it. I wonder if you might just be able to copy and paste a code chunk from in here that's interesting to you and just put it into your custom, your custom CSS file along with all the other sharing and things. Um, it's worth a try, but I have not tried it myself yet, but that's where you would start. Um, and so back to the libs folder, the general one, this is that remark CSS folder that I was saying holds the default CSS file. And so here it is. 
And so we're just gonna click it and open it up right inside the RStudio IDE. And let me just minimize this a little bit. Okay, and so this is uh, obviously a new kind of file. So it has the extension CSS for cascading style or style sheets. Um, and it still has color coding associated with it. So you can kind of tell what's what. And so again, this is the file that gets used for a standard sharing in template. And um, what did I want to do for this piece? Okay, yeah, so we're going to go through some of the different pieces. And I'm going to ask people to be a, a little bit interactive with this piece. I'm going to ask as we scroll through, if people can use the chat box to drop in just as we're viewing the things, if anything pops out as looking familiar from either from anything that we might have discussed today or shown today in a demo or from something that we saw on Tuesday. So again, we're just gonna scroll through. And then if you see anything that pops out to you as something that looks familiar, please drop it in the chat box. Okay, so we're gonna start here. There's this first chunk. And then there's a next one. And we'll go through more of the basics in a second. We're just browsing this for right now. Just becoming familiar with what it looks like and the different components that are in there. Yep, awesome. We have used inverse for class and also people are mentioning the 20% with the columns came up on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Very nice, very nice. What else? What else looks familiar? Pull right, awesome. And that's right here and right here. And these last ones may not look familiar. Um, they certainly wouldn't look familiar from my workshop, but you might've seen them in some other context. Um, and yeah, pull right, exactly. Okay, that's awesome. So y'all are on the ball and you're identifying things that you've already seen. So the way I like to think about this is you have your R Markdown file where you're using classes using um, that syntax where it's dot, and then the word, so for example, here, dot, and then the word, and then you have square brackets. That's how it shows up in your R Markdown file. And then when you look at the styling sheet, it's kind of like looking under the hood or behind the scenes and saying, okay, what's going on that's helping create what I'm using in my R Markdown file? And so this is um, providing properties that we can, we can tweak to make things look a little bit different. And then I'll go ahead and point out here, I believe it, it might have been Emma, correct me if I'm wrong, who had asked on Tuesday if there was a way to get rid of that extra space on the top of the right section of the slide when you're using the left column and right column layout. And so I had mentioned that there was, there was some padding that was automatically added there in the, uh, in the default template. And so if you wanted to modify that, then this is where I would go. And so we can see that the right column um, has a padding dash top property right there and it's got a value associated with it as well. Okay, so now we've taken a look at that. Let's go back to our slides. Oh, EM. Yeah, thank you. EM. Let me go back to this. It's a unit. Um, it's a unit of size here. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But when you're talking about size of things in a CSS file, you're going to see PX for pixels. And okay, great. And then um, you're going to see REM and you're going to see EM. And I'm not sure if there's an example of REM in here as we can check later. Um, and you know, I don't remember exactly what that stands for. 
Uh, so we can just look it up. Um, EM typography. An M is a unit in the field of typography. I'm looking right here. Okay, so I guess we can we can look them up a little bit more later on. But uh, I think what you what you maybe want to take away is that EM and REM are both units that scale with what's going on around them. Thanks, Laurie. Um, and so these are important things to consider when you're choosing sizes of your fonts or line spacing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that on this, in, the, in the upcoming slides. Thanks, Lori, that's really helpful. Um, okay. And whoa, goodness. Okay, so we looked at the default CSS file. So now we're just gonna cover some of the basics. And um, what's see here? So you can make it absolute or relative. Yeah, exactly, Jonathan. And so there are reasons why you may not want to always make it absolute or always make, you make them um, relative. And I think a big part of that just has to do with not being sure where, where people are gonna be viewing the content. And so if they're viewing it on a smaller screen um, or a bigger screen, you may not necessarily want the ratios to stay the same. And so there are a couple of tricks that you can keep in mind. And I'm, I'm sharing a really nice resource in the slides um, if people wanna read more about that and how to decide when to use pixels um, or absolute units or relative ones. Okay, so going back to the basics. So we talked about rules. So there are rules that we follow, or rather rules that Sharingan follows when it's styling um, the HTML produced by our markdown file. And so this image shows the basic structure that we're gonna come across and that you've already noticed from going through the default styling sheet that we just went through. So you'll see that our sheets have a bunch of CSS rules. Um, there are selectors of various types. So just like this image here has a selector here with the dot in front of it. They don't always have to look like this with a dot in front of it. This is just one example. This is called a class selector. And which again, everyone's already seen and, um, and we've identified today in that sheet. And then each of these um, rules might have one or more properties within it that are assigned some value. So there's always a selector and then there's some kind of declaration. And in this particular example, the property they're referring to is background image, which may also look familiar from, from things that we've looked at in our slides already, uh, probably on Tuesday. And then in this case, they're using a function, so a URL, and then they're providing um, an argument to find that, that image that's then gonna be used as a background image. And then I've linked to um, a resource for that there at the bottom. There's lots of links that you can look at um, when you have more time later. And so moving on to sort of selectors in general, selectors uh, basically identify kind of groups of related things or elements within your sheet. So they point to an element that needs to be styled. So in this example on the left, the, the rule is styling the heading, like a level one heading, which is H1. And so I just wrote here that the rules can be written on one line, like the example on the left, or on multiple lines, like I've typed it up on the right-hand side. And so in this case, this rule is selecting all level one headers which is the same as um, using one hashtag in R markdown. And so you can imagine that a level two header would be using the two hashtags. But in this case, we're modifying all of the level one headers and we're assigning them the color blue and a font size of 12, um, 12 pixels. And then I did look this up and unlike with many R functions, color spelled C-O-L-O-R cannot be replaced by color spelled C-O-L-O-U-R um, in CSS land, so I apologize for that. That's probably pretty annoying. But just heads up, if you tried to replace C-O-L-O-R with um, the version with a U here, it, it will not work. Uh, okay, so moving on to specifically class selectors, which are the most common ones that we're encountering. Um, again, it begins with a, with a dot, with a period, which we've already noticed. 
And then I wrote here as a question, which we've kind of already talked about, which is where else have we heard the term class or seen that dot syntax? And so some of you already pointed out that, um, you know, with the inverse class that we've already used it in our slide making and that we've already used certain classes that are identified with that dot in front of the, the word. Um, and so on the right hand side, I've got an example specifically of the inverse, um, the inverse class. And so, and I pulled this from the default CSS style sheet that we just looked at. And so if you were to look at this, you could read it like all HTML elements with class inverse will have a background color of um, this hex code, will have text color of this hex code, and then we'll also have a text shadow. Um, corresponding to this. And so in this case, the default sharing and theme has inverse slides where the text has a little bit of a shadow. And so uh, I, I would have to look this up, but I believe that there's no shadow. I think it's top, top sides, bottom maybe, I think is how this is typed in. So I think there's like no shadow on the top, no shadow on either side, and then 20 pixels of shadow on the bottom um, of the text. And then this is another hex code that corresponds to a color. And so I've written here on the left-hand side as a tip that you could try prismatic. The prismatic package has a color function where you can put as a string in the hex color code and it'll show you, um, it'll output the color code, but the background of it will be, will be representative of that color. It's not perfect, but it does work pretty well. And it gives you a really nice um, idea of what the color looks like inside of R. So I recommend people check that out. Whoops, we skipped ahead. Okay, so then with elements, we talked about selectors and we can also talk about elements. Um, and so in this case, this particular code chunk that's also coming from the default CSS file can be read as all HTML elements of type A, which are anchors or links, including those that are of type code. So code, that's, in, that's a link, that's how this is read. And the comma separates the two um, and applying the same rules to both is gonna get assigned the color corresponding to RGB 2493814 and are assigned uh, no text decoration. So none here. And then I've linked to resources for how you can look that up. I've also put the site here, oh, which sadly isn't showing up, um, but it's a, I guess I can just click on it. It's a nice resource that you can go to from cssstricks.com and it shows you all the different selectors and all the different properties. And so I come to this all the time when I wanna look up something that I, I don't know how to, modify. So for example, text shadow is something that I didn't remember. So I'm just going to do, I did a control find to find the keyword for text shadow and it's a property. And then I'm just going to click it and show you real quick what that looks like. And so they have a nice page where they show you an example and then they'll tell you what the different values correspond to. So it's a really great resource and I recommend folks check that out as well. Um, okay, and then now we're just going to look through the NHSR themes style sheet and we're going to go through this one piece by piece on the slides. So we're not going to open it up. You can follow along if you want to open up um, the sheet in your cloud project, but we're just going to go through it chunk by chunk here anyway. Okay, so I mentioned this in a, a previous slide, but anchors and links correspond to um, the letter A. That's the element that is mapped to them. And so in the default CSS file, this is what it looks like, which is something that we looked at a little bit ago. And for the NHSR file, um, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start saying the original file and then our modified file. I think it'll be a little bit easier for me. So in our modified file, um, there's a different color. There's also a border bottom and which is, you know, two pixels. Um, 
thick and it's a solid line. And then there's a certain color that I picked for that that I put here. And then I also modified the line height. Um, and I chose to do that for this one because if I had multiple links uh, underneath each other, I was seeing that they were overlapping a little too much and they weren't as readable. And so I wanted to make it, give it a little more separation. And so this is an example of using that EM unit where I'm saying, okay, the line height is one and a half times larger than the size of the text that's going in that, um, in that link or in that anchor. Excuse me. Okay, and then this next piece is a little interesting. So this one, this one specifies, um, uh, I guess I'm not sure what the correct term is. I think it might be something like action, like it's an action that the element does. And so in this case, we're saying that when you hover over an element A or when you hover over a link, then, then apply this rule. And so the rule there is to get rid of that border bottom. And so I'll just show you a real quick example with a slide we were just looking at. Okay, so for example, this one, this is a link. So this is the element A that we're just looking at. And it's got a nice thick border on the bottom. And then when I hover, it goes away. So the border bottom um, equals to zero makes it go away. I like this feature because it's, it's a very visual way of indicating that you're hovering over something. I think for accessibility purposes, it's nice to have um, other cues that something is changing. And so I find that having something like that, like a border on the bottom that goes away or having no border bottom and then having it come up um, is a nice way to, to indicate change aside from using something like a color change, for example. Okay, so this is back to where we were before. Um, other action words that you might find, um, I think there's one called active, and that indicates what it looks like, how it's styled when it's clicked on. So as opposed to just hovering, if you want it to be styled a certain way when you click on it, then I believe the word that would go here is active. And you'd be able to find, find more of those in the Almanac too that you can look up. Okay. The next piece, headings. Um, so the default string and theme didn't have any properties that it changed from the root HTML file. And um, the default root properties are that text, text begins at 16 pixels and that, uh, and that it's the color black. And so sharing in the default theme didn't deviate from that. So it didn't make any modifications. And then here is where I mentioned this resource that I was talking about earlier about font sizes and units. And so in a nutshell, document level adjustments, so like to the root um, uh, content should be, should be, um, should use pixels. So they're sort of that absolute unit. And then modules, so for example, classes that go kind of within the overall structure of the document scale with the document. And so you would use um, REM, which I think R might stand for relative here, I'm not 100%. And then lastly, type will scale with modules in EM. So there's kind of a, a hierarchy there. And this article that I linked here is really nice, it gives a really nice overview of that. And so this is what it looks like in our modified sheet. And when I created this template, I hadn't, um, I hadn't read this article. And so I think all of the, or most of the items or the elements in there are using pixels. And so I need to go through and update that myself after having read that article. Um, so just a heads up. Anyway, so headings here are modified with the H1 and the H2 and the H3. So those are the ones that I chose to style a different way. And the class that corresponds to, uh, to, those, to those headings is the remark slide content. So that's kind of like the, the, the class that corresponds to a lot of different features of the slide deck. And so in this, in this particular example, I'm saying uh, all level one, level two and level three headers belonging to this class, uh, please apply these rules. And so um, I have different sizes and different 
colors in some cases, I think. Now these ones are all the same color, but different sizes for sure. And then different line heights also. Okay, and then this one, moving on, so we're sort of moving through the different chunks of our modified sheet. So compared to the default sheet, there wasn't anything specific about the paragraph text. So the paragraph text meaning most of the text that you see written out, so not belonging to a particular heading, but just the text that you would write without a hashtag before it, for example. Uh, for this theme, I ended up changing the font size. I made it a little bigger. And then I changed the line height also, so that if you had um, one line that was directly under another, that there wouldn't be sort of overlap, that they'd be well spaced out. And the next piece I have here are horizontal bars. And so uh, Sharingan just used standard values. Sharingan, a default template or default uh, sheet didn't use any, didn't make any modifications. And then for, for our modified theme, HR, which corresponds to hor the horizontal bar, um, has a few different modifications. And so content means, and I found out, I found this out by modifying it myself, but um, you can add content to the bar itself. So you can add text if you want. And I, I chose to leave that blank so that you could just insert horizontal lines without anything else if you wanted to. And you use you do that by using four or more dashes in your R markdown. And then, um, and then there's a few other things. And so, but mainly I think the background color and the height were the ones that made the most difference. Look at the time real quick. Okay, I wanna make sure we have plenty of time to play around. So I wanna keep an eye on that. Um, okay, so this section I call bottom of slide stuff. And, and if you're looking through the NHSR CSS file, you'll see that it's commented and I tried to do my best at com commenting it in a way that um, would be easier to refer to later. And so hence a name like bottom of slide stuff. Um, and so the default theme has uh, a footnote, for example, that's styled in a particular way. There's a certain position of it. There's, um, there's a certain padding. I think there's space. The bottom means there's space at the bottom between the bottom of the slide and then where the footnote starts. So maybe you don't want it right at the bottom edge. You wanted it a little bit higher. And then the font size is a little bit smaller, for example. And so I'd like to pose a question for the chat box is how, how do we write comments in CSS? So looking at what we're looking at right now, um, what would you say would be a good way to write a comment in a style sheet in terms of syntax? Yep, you got it. So that slash and the asterisk start off the, um, the comment and then you end the comment, whether it's on a single line or an entire chunk with another asterisk and, um, and a bar. Looks like magic ones, it kind of does. <laughs> um, okay. And then for our theme, there are some adjustments to it. So not a lot of them, but there's some. I think I moved it closer to the edge a little bit to give a little bit more room for the big content chunk. And then, um, oh, similar to SQL. Yes. I can't say I use SQL as, as much. So I don't even think I've commented, but yeah, I think I, think I do remember that. Um, what else? Okay, padding to the right. So that's padding from the right edge of the slide because I didn't want a long footnote to run off past like a nice clear margin around the slide. And so I moved it. Um, well, this is actually the same. So I didn't actually move it, but that's what it's there for. It's to create some space between the, the right edge of the slide and then where the footnote would end. And then I made it a little bit smaller. So I made the font size 80% and then I fiddled with the line height again. Um, and then the other piece that I have here that is not present in the default um, theme 
is the, the slide number. So I, I don't remember, I don't recall exactly what color the default slide number is at the bottom, but I just remember thinking I wanted it different. It might be like a gray color and I just wanted to make it maybe a stronger contrast. So I think I, that's why I used black here. And hashtag 000000, like we see here, is the color black. And then the color white is hashtag FFF, FFF, just for reference. Um, but you can also use human words to describe colors. So we could have also written here black and it probably would have been identified just fine. Same with white. And then there's also other colors that can get identified automatically. I'm not sure what they all are, but I, I definitely know that you can, you can do that. And that can be a really nice, easy way to test a color is just by typing in without having to look up a color code. If you wanna just test something out, then you can just type in um, a human word for it. Okay, this next piece talks about inline code. And so in the default uh, sheet, uh, we see some um, remark code line that's highlighted and it's got a certain background color and it's sort of blocking out by that copy code, but there's a certain color that was assigned. And then I'm just showing in the next chunk below that this up here is written on one line, but you can also write it on multiple lines. So oftentimes I've seen CSS written on one line if there's maybe only one property, but if as soon as there's more than one property, it becomes easier to read when you separate out the properties on their own line. Um, and so here is what that would look like if it were written that way. And then I changed the inline code in our theme and I wrote here some comments. So there's inline highlighting within text just to make it really clear about what that is. And so I changed the font size and the weight. So the font weight is kind of like saying um, whether you'd like it to be bold or not, that's a weight that you're giving that, that type. Um, and so you might find 400 or 300 is like a thinner line for the typeface. 400, I think is pretty standard across my slides. And then headings, I think are maybe, I guess we'll see, but um, headings are a little bit weightier. So there may be 500 or 600 um, and you can go up higher to make it like really, a really thick typeface as well. So that's what that is. Um, and then there's the text color that's specified here. There's a background color that's specified here, which is like a gray color. Well, actually it's, um, it's the same gray that you're seeing here on this slide, that same background. And border radius is what you can use to shape the box that it's around. Some people like it to be very sharp corners. So they might use, um, they might write zero here. And other people's like more rounded corners, so they might use like I did three or maybe even higher if they wanted more rounded corners. Um, and then padding around, padding around the, uh, the text as well. So if you wanted it really close to your text, then maybe you would say zero pixels on all dimensions. And then uh, line highlighting with encode. So that corresponds to the, um, the way that it looks when you indicate in your text that you would like to highlight that line in your text chunk, or sorry, in your code chunk, where you could do it with, I think it's hashtag less than less than. If you write that on the line of your code chunk, then in the output, it'll show up with a background uh, that corresponds to, in our theme, it corresponds to this color, which is again, that light gray, it'll show up just like this color up here. Um, and I think the standard, the default color, which is this one here is like a very bright yellow, um, just for, for reference. Okay. And again, it's not showing up rendered here, but it should show up in the rendered slides online later. I'll, I'll definitely double check. Um, but this was just showing that slide that we went over on Tuesday that shows a YAML. Um, and so, I was saying here that the default style sheet doesn't have anything specific in terms of styling the code chunk. And so I think the styling is just coming from the highlight style, 
property in the YAML. Um, I think that maybe gets sort of takes over and can can style the code a particular way. So a commonly used highlight style is the GitHub style. And so that looks a certain way. And uh, in our slide deck from Tuesday, there's a slide that has all of the different options for highlight style that you could use. The one that's being used in our modified theme is the Google code style. Um, anyway, so that's that. And then for our, uh, for our styling sheet, we have a few different things that are specified here. So I've got one chunk here that is the code chunk kind of background layer. So what I found is that code chunks have like a background layer, rectangular shape, and then there's like an inside um, frame. And so here we talk about whether or not there's a border, if there's a box shadow. I'm somebody who likes the way that box shadows look around things, other people don't like them at all. So if you don't like box shadows and you like it to look very flat, then you could change these to zero. Or if you wanted, you know, a lot of shadow on one side, then you could make those numbers bigger. And then there's also a color specified there. And then um, you can control the padding and then whether there's a background color, and um, this overflow X feature makes it so that if your code goes past the edge of that box, then you can use a little scroll, horizontal scroll bar, which of course it got cut off here because I've got a lot of code taking up space. But normally you'd be able to see a little horizontal scroll bar that you can use to then see the, the rest of your code if it goes off in the horizontal direction. And then border radius again is similar to how we were talking about the, the inline highlighting where some people like it to be sharp corners, other people like the corners to be a little bit more rounded. And then I have here code chunk foreground, which I think, I don't think I commented it this way in the style sheet, but I have information here for that. Um, and then this is where you would control your font size. So I use 18 pixels. So I like it to look, you know, pretty big. Um, let's see, would you be able to wrap instead of scroll? That's a good question. Um, I would suggest looking at that, that resource, the CSS tricks resource and looking up Overflow X and maybe seeing what the different options are. I'm not sure off the top of my head. Whoops, okay. So tables, tables in the default styling sheet are styled this way and tables are a little bit um, trickier for me to wrap my head around. Um, and specific with specific to the Sheringham theme, I was having a hard time styling the header of the table in a way that I wanted to. Um, but this is what the code for that looks like. And you'll see some familiar selectors like, or properties like border top, border bottom. Um, and I'm gonna start moving through a little bit faster. Okay, and then in our sheet, there's also some modifications. So I wanted to change the color, um, I think of the, the even, yeah, the even um, rows in the table are all colored differently than the odd rows. And so the even rows in our tables have that same gray background color that's been consistent throughout the rest of the theme. And then I believe that this section controls, yeah, the table header. And so border bottom indicates the thickness of that line that separates the header of the table from the body. Um, and then there's a similar, similar kind of feature, or I guess um, property that you could probably control for the other ones. And then block quotes. So like this one I've showed here, the one for the default sheet looks uh, is written a certain way. And then for us, it was a little bit different. So I'll ask in the chat box if you can spot the difference between the two, because I know that it looks very similar. So hop in the chat box if you can spot the difference. Different gray. Yeah. So that's the only difference here. Mm -hmm. Color, exactly. So here the color in block quote is uh, light gray. So this is an example of the human human colors um, that you can use. And then in our theme, I changed it to that, that same gray color that I've, I was using consistently elsewhere. 
Good eye. Okay, and then this part's kind of fun and interesting as well. So the inverse class modifications that Sharingan makes are on the left-hand side. Um, whoops. And so I think what I will point out here is when you want to make changes to what the inverse slides look like, then you would just add the selector dot inverse like here. And then after that, you would follow it up with whatever you'd like to, to change. And so I know we've already talked about the inverse um, slide before, but I'm just gonna reiterate um, because you're saying, in this example, you're saying um, down here, you're saying for every level one header within an inverse class and then a level two header within an inverse class and a level three header within the inverse class, all of them get the color F3, 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 which is like an off-white. Um, and so something I wanna emphasize here is that it's not sufficient to say dot inverse H1 comma H2 comma H3, because that's just gonna read it as level one headers, heading one within inverse and also heading two not inverse and heading three not inverse apply this rule. And so if you want to apply something to the inverse class, for example, you have to specify that for every element that you'd like to modify. Now, a quick note here, if you want to modify, for example, a Hugo, the Hugo academic theme, which is very popular for folks that have their personal blog down sites, it's a very similar process where there's a, there's a certain way that the website is styled for their light theme. And then if you wanted to design a dark theme, then you would also use a very similar approach. Only in the Hugo academic theme, um, the word is dark instead of inverse. But I think the same, it's a, probably a similar framework across the board. So just a note in case anybody is interested. And I do have a blog post that talks about designing a dark theme if anybody ever wants to wants to do that. Um, okay, and then in our modified theme, we have a few, a few changes. So I changed the background color to that bright blue NHS color. And then I changed the color of the text to white, which is that those six um, F letters. I took out the text shadow so that it was, um, so that it would kind of lie flat on the slide. And then I changed the, and I, I apologize, I collapsed all of these different code chunks so that they could all fit on the slide. Um, and so I use more of that inline approach to writing them. Um, I think we can scroll over this way. Yeah. So I changed the color of the inverse headings to be white as well. Um, let's scroll back here. What else did I change? The horizontal bars. I also changed for the inverse slides. I made the, the horizontal bar white also. Whoops. And what else did I do here? Okay, and then the links or the anchors for the inverse slides I also changed. So I made them white and then I changed the border bottom to be white as well. And then I said, um, if you notice at the bottom, I know it's hard to see because of that share again bar, but the that feature that we talked about earlier, when, when you hover over a link, the border bottom goes away. That one applies here on the inverse slides as well. Okay, and then we're getting very close to the end of the sheet. The custom title slide uh, class that's in the sheet, um, it doesn't exist in the default sheet. So there's nothing there. Um, and I'll ask, I'll pose a question for the chat box again. Does, I wanna know if anybody um, finds that chunk there familiar. And if, if you do find it familiar, maybe indicate um, where, roughly where in the slide deck you would see it. Okay, so I see top of the example slides. Yeah, so this is the very first slide that you see when you load up the theme from using the template. And so we can see that the class shows up here so we have the custom class in our sheet, and then we refer to that in the class section when we start our new slide, just like we identify other, um, other properties like 
whether you want to move things to the left or the bottom and so on. And so here's what that looks like in our sheet. So there's the there's a section here that I labeled NHS organization logo. So that's the things related to having that placeholder for the organization logo on the title slide. And so here I indicate where that file is. And so you'll see that file path and using that URL function that we mentioned briefly earlier. And then scroll back. And then this next line talks about the background position. So we've talked about some of these things already on Tuesday when we talked about what if I wanna add an image to my slide. And so this is the exact same thing, only we're just seeing it in the, in the styling sheet, whereas normally we might see it in the, in the R markdown file. But it's the same thing. They're the same properties that are being applied. And so in this case, we've said, place the organization logo like 95% of the way to the right and then 10% of the way from the top down. And then the background size is indicated there also. And then I changed the heading, the level one heading for the title slide to be the color black. And um, because the other headings are that bright blue. And then I also made a note here to hide the slide number from the title slide. And so I just wrote display none for that one. Okay, oh, what did I mean to write here? Oh, I forgot to give this a label. Um, what I'm talking about here at the very bottom of our style sheet, I made some custom classes just for text emphasis. And so that's what we see on the right hand side and um, the sharing and default sheet doesn't have any of these custom classes for colors. But this is a really easy way to just have a color available to use whenever you like. And so I added just a few to the bottom of that styling sheet based off of the colors from the NHS identity um, guidelines. And so there's a blue, there's a green, a pink, a red, and then a warm yellow. And that's what those colors correspond to. And then I have an example below of how you would use it. So just like any of the other classes that we've been using, you would just indicate that you're using it by using brackets in your R Markdown file. And then, um, and then the output is what shows up right under that little chunk where I say some pink text here. And so it's just a really nice way to, to quickly change the color of something without having to make some make some adjustment to, that would impact maybe multiple different elements of, uh, of your entire slide deck. We say here helps not having to type out the RGB or hex codes every time. Yes, for sure, for sure. And, um, and something we probably won't get to today, but something that you could do that helps to avoid having to type out the hex codes whenever you want is to use variables. So there's a way you can set up variables at the very top of your styling sheet so that you would say, uh, for example, you would define a variable for blue. Um, I guess it would look very similar to this, the way it's laid out here, but at the top, there's a certain syntax that you use. And then even within your style sheet, you can just refer to that color by using a, a var function. And so it would be var and then it open in parentheses. And then um, the way you would write it would be two dashes and then whatever the name of your of your variable is. And you'll be able to see that if you look at my styling sheet for the slide decks that I'm using, you'll be able to see examples of how to do that. Okay, and then I have a your turn here for just a minute and we'll do this real quick and then we'll spend the rest of the time um, doing some fun stuff. So this your turn says, try adding one of the custom classes below to your NHSR CSS file and try it out in your slide or markdown file using the syntax that I've described there. And then just remember that you can, if you're able to see the slides in the browser, then you'd be able to copy, copy the chunk right from there. Um, so go ahead and take a minute to do that. And just pick one if you like. And uh, we'll meet back here in a little bit.
can you add CSS in a code chunk? Yes, you can. You would just change, um, instead of R, you would put CSS in there. And then I think that would, I think that would have the same effect as applying it from a, from a style sheet. And so you could add that, um, yeah, I guess anywhere before you're planning on using that code. Oh, okay, that's the end of that time. I know it went by super fast. Um, okay, but let's move on so we can have time for some other things. So it's party time. This is the time for everybody to practice some of the stuff that we covered. So I would like to encourage you to um, sort of let go of your inhibitions. Don't worry about what the design is gonna look like or if things are gonna look nicely together or whether there's enough margin around my things or enough white space. I think um, it would be really great if you could just experiment. And so what I would encourage you to do is create a whole new file using the same template. So new file, new R markdown file, template from the NHSR um, package, and then just label it something fun like party theme. And then, um, and then go into that CSS folder and make all those changes that you'd like and then see how they get reflected in your rendered slides. Um, yeah, thanks Lori, that's a really great link. A link to find colors is there. Ooh, I don't think I've used my color dot space. That sounds, like, that sounds nice, thanks for sharing. Um, I do provide a few options in, the, in these slides. So there's a the Google site that I end up using a lot is called coolers.co. And I really like it because it has a bunch of themes already put together, um, color themes that you can just use. And you can also save your little palettes in there, which can be really nice. So like I have a, a palette saved for my website and then I, I'm constantly referring to that palette that I already saved um, in there. But anyway, I know you can't see it on my screen and I apologize again for that. But if you are able to look at the slides later on, um, you'd be able to see the different palettes in here. And then I've just linked a few resources. Some things to keep in mind, not for party time, but for normal times, um, you wanna make sure to check your color combinations for contrast. You don't want your text to look too similar to the background that it's on top of. And there's accessibility standards for that. And so Coolers has a really nice contrast checker that you can use. Um, and then as I was mentioning, you can create and save your own color palettes using Coolers if you like. And then, and then I just a quick reference, the one I tend to go to if I wanna really quickly look up a hex code is um, colorhex.com. But then Josie also shared another one in the chat box, which is excellent. Um, but let me just navigate to this real quick because I wanna show you what the site looks like. Oh, if it would only let me. Well, let's just navigate. I think I'm gonna get there on my own. Uh, colors. There we go. So this is what the website would look like. And you can go to explore, for example. And how do you install an SR theme or Noco machine? Yeah, we can definitely provide a link for that, Leonardo, to do the to install. You have to install it from GitHub. And so um, we can provide that link later on. Um, okay, so this is what I was talking about when I was saying that there's a bunch of color themes that you can just use um, and adapt from. So this is what those might look like. And then they also have a section of dark themes that you can look at. And um, if you want ideas or to get inspired to see what kind of colors you like seeing together, um, it can be a nice way to sort of take some of that cognitive load off of trying to figure out what, you know, what might look good together. And you can always adjust it. So no big deal. Um, what else? Something else, something we didn't get time to go over today is fonts. And so I know the NHS is quite particular about font choices. Um, and they only allow two font choices, which are uh, the Arial standard font that I think most systems have installed already. And then there's another font called Frutiger or Frutige. And, um, and that's another option. Now that's a paid font. And so, for example, I don't have it on my machine. And that's why I styled all the slides using the Arial font face. Um, but let me just show you real quick what it would look like if you did want to change the fonts. 
And, and that's actually a lot easier, I think, than styling the main sheet. So let me just quickly show you uh, what that looks like. Okay, so I'm in my example slides. I'm going to my CSS folder, and then I'm going to this fonts sheet. So Sheringen requires a fonts, um, a fonts styling sheet in addition to a main one, but the fonts sheet has very little in it. So the idea is to do most of your tweaking in the main file, and then only really change your font faces in the font styling sheet. And so here you can see those two fonts that I included that are approved by the NHS identity guidelines. And so um, I, would, I will say that a way you, you can play around here is with the code font because there aren't specifications for which font to use um, within code, like which monospace font. And so I would encourage you to look up some, some monospace fonts that you like. So in this example, for this theme, I just picked the Roboto Mono monospace font, but we can look up some other ones as well. Let me show you how to do that. Um, but just really quickly, this looks very similar to the other sheet that we were looking at. This um, element or selector, I think maybe it's both, um, specifies the font family for everything basically. And then the headings themselves in particular are assigned a different um, or can be assigned a different font family. And then, uh, and then again, here's what the code, whether it's inline or in a code chunk would look like. So if we wanted to change the font, we could go to the Google fonts page, for example, which has three fonts available. Oh, maybe I shouldn't, I shouldn't have done it that way. Okay, let's just look up. Okay, so here we are on the Google fonts page and I'm just gonna narrow it down by looking at monospace fonts. And, you know, you could pick, I don't know, one that would look considerably different. Okay, maybe we can pick this one. Major mono display. We would pick a font and some of them have multiple different weights. We talked about weights earlier. So this is an example of a weight. So this font is only available in a regular weight um, of, of 400. So we can't, we can't download a version of it that's like bold. Um, and so if we wanted to use this one, we would say, select this style, just kind of like adding it to your cart, but it's all free. Um, and then you would click over here to where it says add import because we wanna import it into our sheet. And then it just gives us the really easy, um, the really easy text to copy and paste into our sheet. And so I just copy everything that is between those style um, tags. So I'm gonna copy that and put it over here in my sheet. And I'm just gonna add it on. So I don't need to delete the other one. I can just keep adding on the interesting ones that I find. But what I will do is now I wanna adjust it. And the page we were just looking at shows us how to do that as well. And so you could just copy and paste that um, if you wanted to, and it would look a lot like that. So maybe I don't wanna use this one right now. Um, and so maybe I could comment it out and just use this new one. But the other thing you could do is just add it in line like we did for the Arial and the Frutage fonts. And so maybe we could just copy this and we put it here at the beginning. And so the reason why there's two, or I, I should say the, the, yeah, I guess it's a reason. The reason why there's often more than one font whenever you look at a styling sheet is because not everybody's gonna be able to view the font that you designed your slides in for a variety of reasons or browser or who knows. Um, and so it's good to have like the main font that you would like your, to show your slides in. And then the fonts that come after that are like backup fonts. So it's like, okay, if the first one's not available, then go to the second one. And if the second one's not available, then move on to the third one and so on. And when you run out, like let's say somebody didn't have Arial or Fruitage, then it would default to, I think what the root HTML 
styling is, which I, I believe is Times New Roman. Um, but that's that's why you might see multiple different fonts when you when you open somebody else's CSS file. Um, yeah, so if anybody, for example, was using this Fridigé font, like you have it on your computer and you make your slides using it, and then you share your slides with me, you know, in some way, and I open them, I don't have that on my computer, and so I would see them in Arial if, if this were the other way around, uh, like this. This is an example. Okay, but now we added this, this new font, so let's see if it shows up on the other side. Um, let's look at our viewer. We might have to re-render. Oops, okay, let's see. Okay, so there we see we've modified all of the code to use that new font that we just downloaded. Um, yeah. Okay. Question. Do you need to specify Times New Roman or some other default? I think it's handled automatically, Jonathan. Um, I'm not hundred percent certain, but I think it is handled automatically because if we don't, if we don't apply any styling sheet, then you, it's not like you, it would disappear and you wouldn't be able to see anything. There's still, there's still something there. So for example, if we go to our YAML and let's say I I, um, I didn't type this correctly. Maybe I made a typo and maybe I made another typo here and maybe one here to the point where Sharingan doesn't know what styling sheet to use because it can't find them. Um, okay, well, of course it's giving me an error because it knows that it's incorrect. Um, let's try it this way. Like this one. Okay, so the default one is in there. Okay, hold on. I'll find a good example to show you. Okay, so this is what the slide looks like without any styling. Um, and so this styling is not specified by the sharing and style sheet because when we looked at it, we didn't see any specific anything. Um, and then what else? Yeah, but this is what it would look like if you if you didn't apply any kind of styling. So it looks, it's functional, it doesn't look bad. Um, it just doesn't look nice, you know? And so that's why we, we use styling sheets everywhere. Um, so yeah, so here we're adding it back in and then it'll, it'll update and follow the new rules. Um, yeah, you're welcome. What else we have here? Thanks so much for battling through the tech challenges. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. Thanks everybody for being so patient. This was, um, yeah, quite the challenge and I really appreciate you you sticking it out with us. Um, I think that's all the time that we have. Let me see if there's anything else. No, oh, yeah, I guess I'll just end here. Um, how does the metadata and then adjust theme look how they feel in your descriptor? Um, the metadata just, it just comes from the way it's added in is just using the R markdown file metadata, I think, with the with the dollar sign to pull something from the YAML. Is that what you're asking, Peter? Or the metadata? I'm not sure if I answered that question. Uh, where do you add the import? Okay, the import goes into the fonts file. And so if we come over here, there's that specific fonts styling sheet in that CSS folder. And so you would just add that import link just right underneath, but at the, whoops, but at the top of the, of the sheet. Script field on the NHS title slide does not seem to be filled in from our YAML. Okay, let's take a look. Um, the descriptor. Just title slide does not seem to be filled in. Huh. I guess I'm not sure. Are you when you say descriptor? Are you referring to the the subtitle? I just need a little bit of clarification. Um, and then where should people 
send their party slides. Oh, yes. So one of the things I wanted to do is if people wanted to send their party themes or share their party slides with me, um, I'd be happy to showcase them on the workshop site. And so keep an eye out on my repo. I'm gonna create, I'm gonna open up an issue in here for a question box if people have any questions about sharing it in general that they'd like some assistance with or some troubleshooting with. And then I'll open up another issue for, for submitting your party themes if you would really like to. Thanks for that reminder, Lori. Okay, so Pierce says, take a look at the title slide top right, your descriptor goes here. Oh, yes, thank you. So the top right is a, it's an image. And so it's just a placeholder image um, that's been put there, just like you might put a logo. I just pulled this image from the NHS identity guidelines and that's what that's what's populating that spot. So it's not actually coming from our YAML. So folks might already have their own um, organization logos that they need to put there. And actually that reminds me, let me just show you, I know we looked at this quickly earlier, but let me just show you exactly where you would do that if you wanted to change it. So we're opening up the main CSS file right now. And at the bottom is where we find those custom classes. And so here's the title slide. You can replace the this file, the logo title slide file with whatever you would like. Um, and you can also, of course, specify any other any other image in that file path. Um, and then one last thing is there's that insert logo file right here. So we'll see that our slides have the title slide logo that we put in there, but it also has an NHS logo in the top right. This is controlled by this HTML file. And the only reason it's added in this way is so that it could be wrapped up into the package and make it easy for everybody to have them. Um, but it's, it's, um, it's just it's some additional code to indicate where to put the, the logo and it kind of handles it on its own. But if you wanted to swap it out for a different logo, like there's a, I believe there's a logo black file in the image folder that you can use then you would change that here. So I guess we can try doing that. And then here is also where you would specify which classes to skip um, putting the slide on. So I've already skipped anything that uses title slide doesn't get the logo, anything that uses inverse doesn't get the logo, anything that uses a class hide logo also doesn't get the logo. So I've saved this new image there and let's see if it updates. Just Oops. Re render and see if it changed. Well, you get the idea. I think I'm going to stop trying to show you things in the interest of time. Um, I just want to really thank everybody for taking the time to be very patient today with all the issues that we had. Um, and then please feel free to reach out if you have any other questions. Thank you so much to Lori for her help today. And thank you so much for the, to the NHSR community for hosting me and letting me give this workshop.